All right, <laughs> I think things are good. Sorry for the the uh, delay. Um, there's an issue with YouTube on my end. I could not get into the live mode. So let's just pause one minute, make sure you guys can hear me, you guys can see me, and we'll get started with today's live. This is a public live. I am just setting up the chat. Hopefully things don't collapse here. All right. <laughs> no, tiny. I wasn't. I got stuck in the greenhouse twice after we talked about it a couple days ago. I got stuck in um, two days ago, and it was a problem actually getting out. I got out. Um, right now, the door is left open. I am going to be fixing that problem. All right. Yeah. What a hassle. I've been sitting here for like twenty-five minutes trying to uh, figure out why stuff wasn't working so let's get started with today's garden grounds this is a public live event really for me to uh, present something quickly i'm going to present um, fertilizers the primary fertilizers the secondary fertilizers i'll go over those i will take all of your questions um, and again this is a public event i have perk memberships where i do this four or five times a month i have live classrooms it's a smaller chat group we're on like an hour or so um, I'll present a topic, I'll answer questions, but I can really talk with you and help you kind of manage what's going on in your gardens. Along with that, the people in the chat are wonderful. They help everybody out too. This video is, I wanted to show you, sponsored by Bentley Seeds. And Earth Day, we know, is on April 22nd. I will put information about Bentley Seeds in the video description, but you can see all these different packets. You can contact them, get seeds for Earth Day, any kind of corporate event, birthday parties, any kind of event that you may want a specialized packet of seeds, they can design for you. So it's really cool. I've been working with Bentley for many years. Um, they're a wonderful seed company. And again, that information will be in the video description. So let's get started with a couple questions um, that you might have. Go ahead and throw them out there. If you have questions regarding fertilizer, that would be best because that's what the theme is. We're going to wait just a few more minutes before I get started with the topic. Um, because it took me uh, 17 minutes past the hour to get on. So I figure some people are getting notifications now that we're live. All right. I got to calm down now <laughs> so that I can uh, talk through this. The weather's beautiful. It's like summer here now. Oh, greetings from South Africa. One of the love... One of the things I love about gardening is we're all the same. doesn't matter where we're born, who we are, what we do. Gardening doesn't change much across the globe. And it's really cool to be chatting with somebody from South Africa now. Um, you know, gardeners are wonderful people across everybody, the entire globe. All right. All right, no questions yet. And if you are coming in as kind of a public follower, you see this going on, if you type in bold question first and then your question, it's a lot easier to, for me to see. When, we're do, when I'm doing a, a public event like this, a lot of stuff comes through the feed. However, today, because I was late getting on, maybe there won't be that many people joining. All right, so quick overview on fertilizers. And this is really focused for like new gardeners. You have your primary nutrients, your elements. You have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's what your plants need the most. That's what's what we're typically adding in. And when you look on a package of fertilizer, be it a granular, organic granular, and when you get those pow powdered gran granulars that are dry in your hand, they're slow release. And you would sprinkle them on the ground slowly over the weeks and months. They break down and they feed your plant. You have the water-soluble fertilizers. You mix into a gallon of water. That is in the form, be it organic or one of the chemical fertilizers people like you and I make, that the nutrients in there are immediately available to your plant. And you would pour it on your plant. Your plant gets the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, plus a bunch of other things I'll talk about in a second. So if you're starting up your garden, by far, start a compost pile now. You want to have compost. Maybe you don't have the room, I understand. But if you can, compost is the best for your garden. Then we go to the organic granular fertilizers, the powdered kind of slow released granular, granular type stuff and a water soluble. So if you're just getting started, you're probably gonna need some sort of dry granular fertilizer. 
and a water soluble fertilizer and you use them throughout the garden that's something you can check out my youtube channel and you can learn how to use them for those of you that don't like the q a format i have plenty of videos just search nitrogen phosphorus potassium and you will get a quick video that talks about those but in this format um, i want to be able to chat with you guys so the primaries nitrogen phosphorus potassium the secondary macronutrients are sulfur calcium and magnesium and your plants need them a lot less and sometimes they're not shown on the package or you have to look for them because they're not used as much we don't over worry about them but when you buy a chemical water soluble they usually cover everything primary nutrients secondary nutrients trace elements everything and that would be something like miracle grow you may might hate the company but chemical fertilizers will not harm you will not harm your plants, will not harm the soil unless you really, really abuse them. I don't recommend them as your primary fertilizer, but maybe you need that. So every year we're kind of getting the soil in shape. We're using organic granular, we're using water soluble fertilizer, and that feeds the plants through the year. And you have to kind of learn a routine to do that. If you have compost, you know, that is really best for your garden. But I want to take questions because this is really a Q&A on the topic today, fertilizer. So let me buzz back here to the um, chat and we'll start with that. Uh, Southern Bell, how often should I feed my one month old transplant tomatoes and peppers with the water soluble fertilizer? Very good question. And if your transplants, I'm um, guessing have, well, here's how I do it. So if you're growing transplants, after the plant germinates, in about seven, 10 days or so, I feed the plant with a super dilute water-soluble fertilizer. Um, indoors, I'll use a chemical type. Outdoors, I'll use fish emulsion um, or agrothrive. I try and stay organic, but the organics really stink when you're using them in the house. So I would really whatever let me rephrase it so let's just say you're going to use miracle grow miracle grow is like a 24 12 16 um water soluble fertilizer those numbers are way too high use that at like quarter strength or see if it has an indoor use but you really want to use a low amount fish emulsion agro thrive i cut that in half and the point is is that you're just giving your transplants very low amounts of the nitrogen phosphorus and potassium the the primary macronutrients in those little cells or in our cups that we're growing or transplants, good or bad, organic, chemical, not whatever, you can over concentrate the fertilizers and it can damage the plants. So at about seven, 10, 14 days, I'll give my tomato plants, my pepper plants, a first drink of a water soluble fertilizer and I just keep an eye on them. If the plants turn, tend to yellow a little bit or they look a little bit weak, I'll give them a little, bo little more um, water soluble fertilizer in about seven days the whole idea is slow and steady you can do more harm over doing it when your seed or when your seed germinates or when the plant first germinates it actually lives off the seed coat and gets everything that it needs so slow and steady seven to 14 days afterwards after germination uh, Linda, I think that I'm beginning to see some spider spider mites around my garden. Is it normal for this time of year? I'm in zone seven. seven. Uh, spider webs and spiders are good for the garden. They will catch insects. They're good insects. They do good things. So spider webs are fine. Spider mites are, you need a magnifying glass and they tend to live like on the undersides of um, bean leaves cucumber leaves are on the undersides of different plants so they don't really come till it's warmer and you would turn your plant over and you would see kind of a little bit of webbing and stuff like that i use peppermint oil that works really well to deter spider mites off my cucumbers and beans but if it's spider webs like around the garden you know i tend to like them and leave them angela what is a good soil temperature to plant summer crops very good question so there's two things you keep in mind when you're putting in your summer crops the ambient or surrounding temperature not bringing a frost meaning the temperatures drop to 32 degrees the leaves freeze you get damaged plants even if you're not getting a frost you could have temperatures where your soil temperature staying like at 40 degrees Fahrenheit 
um, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. You really want your warm crops to have that top two, four, six inches of soil where the root zone is to start to be at least in the 50s, but 60s, 70s. Is that's when the roots warm up, the plants take off, and everything gets going. So if I had to pick a number, I would be looking at 60 degrees. Um, when the sun is beating down, if it, like today it's going to be 70 or something, it was 80 the other day, that top two inches of my soil is really starting to warm up. And that's how you know that, you know, six inches of the soil is starting to warm. What does that mean? So like two or three weeks ago, we started getting warmer temperatures, warmer rains, and that's how I know my soil temperature is warming up. You don't need to use a thermometer or kind of measure the temperature. You kind of look at where the night's staying, what are the day temperatures getting in, what kind of rains are you having that are warm rains, but you definitely, you know, I would say 60 degrees. And the reason you want that is that you could put out like a really nice tomato transplant that you grew that's like this tall and you put it out when the soil temperatures are staying at 40 or 50 degrees and you take care of it and you shelter it and you do all these things and it just sits there. It might even turn purple and not do a whole lot. That's because the roots are too cold and it's just waiting for the right time. So getting a bigger tomato plant out several weeks early when the temperatures of the soil are wrong isn't necessarily going to get you bigger plants and food faster to your table. Tiny, is it worth it um, to time the nutrients for fruiting plants, nitrogen in the beginning, and then boost it with a fertilizer for flowers? Um, does it make that big of a difference? I don't think so. Some people swear by it. If you're doing farming on a bigger scale and you want to adjust the phosphorus and potassium, that's great. So what she's saying is nitrogen builds stem growth, leaf growth, plant growth. It's what greens up your plant. And when I like plant a plant, I'll give it a shot of water soluble fertilizer. I have lots of compost in my garden already. That gets it growing. I don't do much after that. I might add in some like a top dressing of the organic granular fertilizer mid season or something like that. That's because I know that I have a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium or compost in my soil. I don't find much difference if I hit like say my pepper plants, plant them, water soluble, nitrogen, they get to about two feet tall, I start seeing flowers, and then I hit them with phosphorus and potassium to help with flowering and fruit production. I don't see much difference. I always experiment with it. Um, it there is truth that you can get more flowers, you can get more uh, fruiting but the issue is is if your soil already has nitrogen phosphorus potassium we're just adding extra the plants don't need i mean it's really about if the plants aren't able to draw in enough phosphorus and potassium for flowering and fruiting then there's something wrong overall with your garden and that means you have to add in more compost more organic matter maybe manures and get that soil up to where it needs to be. We're kind of tricked, and I probably participated in this over the years with YouTube because I was full too, in thinking that we just have to keep buying and buying and buying and buying. Years ago it was chemical fertilizers, then it was organic fertilizers, then it was water-soluble fertilizers. And to keep buying them and using them when you don't really need to, when you have a garden that is beautifully made with compost and organic matter. And that's what I'm trying to stress this year on my channel is people building up the soil that way. And then you really spend less money on these products. You, you just don't need them. That being said, I understand that if you can't compost, you can't compost. If you need the fertilizers, you need them. If you're growing in containers, containers are a whole different beast because you have limited space, the soil microbiology isn't the same as the earth, and your big plants, when they're tall, suck the life out of those plants. So you always have to be adding fertilizer back in. So that was a long way to say, I don't think it makes much difference when your plants are out in the ground. If you're in containers and you're growing peppers or things that need to fruit or flower, that might be the time to give them a boost of potassium or phosphorus. And there's a product called more bloom. I'm not affiliated with them. That's a water soluble that's zero nitrogen, 10 phosphorus, 10 potassium. And you would use that, you kind of mid growth to boost your plants up. And that's very, much more important for your container plants than it is your earth beds. All right. So
just going back here, finding where I left off. Angela, can I use horse manure semi-dry? It did wonders for my garden last year. You can. So any manures, uh, dry, you know, overly wet, whatever process, as long as the manures are well broken down, you don't want to put fresh manures into your garden because if you mix it into the top couple of inches, it's still decomposing and it's actually going to pull nitrogen out of the earth to decompose and then it'll give the nitrogen back. But while it's doing that, it's going to challenge your seeds and plants that you're putting in. So manures are great to put down at the end of the season, right on top of your soil, let it do its thing over the months of winter, work it into the top inches. If you're going to add manure now on the surface is okay if you're planting transplants into there. So you would dig beyond the manure into the earth, put your transplants in, that manure will break down and feed the plants. If you put manure down that's kind of heavy and you're trying to put seeds into that, it's gonna be problematic. Um, but the more that the manure is broken down, the more it's like compost, the more it's friendly to the garden, the more easily you could start seeds in it if you wanted to. But manures are wonderful. Um, Jason, can I, I just saw this. So remember, if you're just coming on as a public, um, if you're just coming on as a subscriber and you're in here for the first time, please put question in bold in front of your question so I see it, but I just happen to see Jason's. Can I add fish fertilizer to my transplants going into the garden? Is it safe for all veggies? Fish fertilizer can be used. It's safe for anything that you wanna uh, pour it on. It is ground up rotting decayed fish where basically the fish is decayed down so nitrogen phosphorus potassium minerals and stuff are in, are in a form that your plants can use question how soon can plants be placed after applying compost to chicken manure same sort of sounds the same thing that i said if it's well broken down and you know that it's well composted um you can kind of mix it into your soil and you, you're ready to plant and use it. Any compost or manures that you put down just on the surface, even mulch, you just move it out of the way, you put your transplant in. Transplants will grow into the earth, so it doesn't matter so much what's on the surface, that will break down over time and get to your plants. If you're using your um, chicken manure or your manures and you plan to do seeds, that's when you have to make sure that it's well broken down. So if you've mixed in um, your composted chicken manure, you feel like it's good stuff, I would wait just a couple of weeks and then go ahead and plant the seeds. And you just wanna get everything kind of working and going on in there. Um, but the more it's broken down, the less time you have to wait and stuff like that. And I would I would test it out. Um, you know, if depending on what you're doing, there's nothing wrong with putting in some quick germinating radish seeds and just see what they do. They should germinate in three to five days with these temperatures that we're having now, at least here in Maryland, and then you can see how they're growing. And it's a good idea to kind of take notes and you're gonna kind of learn, you know, maybe, um, Sandra, you're kind of, what What am I trying to say? <laughs> maybe you're, you have chickens, you're collecting the compost, you're in control of it, you know what's going on. You just kind of work out a plan. Maybe you're getting it from a different place. You're gonna learn, is this good quality stuff? What can I do with it? And that's what I recommend, is that if you can't make your own compost, you're not composting your own manures, you may have to find a bag product, which is fine. Um, you gotta learn about it and see how it works in your garden. Or if you're going to a farm or a landscaping company, you wanna learn about how they kind of put their soils together, their compost together, and stuff like that. Karen, what is your opinion on planting two pepper plants together in a garden? Well, my opinion is I love that. So I don't know if you've had a chance to see my videos, but for the last five or 10 years, I've been putting two pepper plants into a planting space and they love it. You don't really have any harm in the overall growth. Your production is almost double. They do really well. And in fact, I have a container garden with containers about this round space, maybe that deep where I cut out the bottom and they're all just in a straight row. It's kind of a sunken container garden. In every container I put in two pepper plants. So with like, I think it's actually 13, lucky 13 containers next to each other, just one strip. I put in 26 pepper plants and I've been doing that for years and it, it, it works 100%. Pepper plants, 
you can put almost you know one foot apart if you don't want to put two in a planting space um, I would put two in a five gallon container or something like that um, you can put them much more closely together I'm lucky in Maryland I don't get a whole lot of pepper diseases you might want to do more spacing for airflow if you have some sort of disease that comes in and affects the peppers but I use, um, and if you check out my channel, look up hydrogen peroxide. I use hydrogen peroxide to manage a lot of diseases on my tomatoes and if they show up on my peppers and it does wonders. All right, so we started about 11.20, so we will go till 10 of 12, 30 minutes. Ruth, you're right. I mean, you can't overdo fish emulsions and your organic fertilizers in the sense that they burn or damage your plants. But if it doesn't matter what form, if you're putting too much nitrogen, say, on your tomato plants and you're like doing fish emulsion every week, it's possible your tomato looks beautiful, green, big leaves. But what happens with that excess nitrogen, um, plants don't know when to stop. So they're just sucking in all this extra nitrogen. The leaves are getting bigger and greener and thinner and they're beginning to look really delicious to insects and disease because the plants have too much green growth and they get kind of thin leaved, more susceptible to diseases. The insects can chew them down more. More leaves means more opportunity for disease and insects to land on there, harder to find it. So you can't overdo the organic fertilizers in the sense that they damage or harm your plant out in your earth beds, generally speaking. But you can still give too much where the plants are just have too much nitrogen in them. <laughs> sometimes I have a beard, sometimes I don't. Um, mostly out of just laziness to... Uh, I just don't feel like shaving. All right. Um, question. The temperature next week is expected to go down to the upper 40s at night for three days. Would you suggest that I cover my beds during the night? If you know it's going to stay in the 40s, I would not cover the bed. Warming temperature, even though we might get the cool nights, feel like it may cool the temperature down. The, first of all, the cold's not going to damage your crops unless you get to a frost. The cold is going to take some of the temperature out of your soil, but the earth is a great regulator. So it's holding heat, it's holding cold, it's going back and forth, it's managing itself. So even with three days of 40 degrees, I wouldn't really cover anything. Um, I would only cover if you have plants that can be damaged by frost and there's a chance that a frost is coming in. Uh, question from Dave. Some of my uh, three inch seedlings are beginning to wilt and die after fertilizer. One quarter strength miracle grow. Maybe I should have waited longer. Zone seven. So, one quarter strength means you take, say, like a, let's just say it's a 24, 12, 18 divided by four. You brought it down to like an eight. Four, four. That's a little bit high, but it shouldn't be so high that it damages anything. So some things you can do. Um, I mean, the fertilizer. So here it is. It's wilting. Wilting isn't usually caused by a fertilizer killing a plant. Too much fertilizer, the plant's going to look okay, but it might turn yellow or it might start browning and get crispy on the edge of the leaves or it might get purpley looking. So I'm kind of wondering about the wilting. That's more of an issue with it being able to pull in the water from the, the, you know, from the soil through the roots or there being some sort of issue like that. If you've already fed it, if it's already moist, the soil is already moist, I would just let the top of the soil dry you know, and see what happens. But there's not much you can do and I'm not feeling like it was from the fertilizer. You could cut the fertilizer down even more and dilute it down to like one fifth, one sixth strength for your other plants. Um, but something else might be going, going on. Sorry, I can't help you more. 
Urban, should I fertilize my wine cap beds? No, oh, that's a good question. And the answer is no. So you, so mushrooms put out all the mycelium, they're fungi, they're wrapping around the hay, the straw, the dying organic matter, the wood matter. Um, for those of you that don't know, I grow wine cap mushrooms and it looks like Stacy started growing some too. As long as you've got plenty of somewhat fresh organic matter in the form of hay, straw, um, wood chips, shredded hardwood, you're fine. Maybe add some more if you haven't done that, um, but you just let them go and let them get all their nutrients from whatever you're putting out there for them to break down. All right, Slave, I've seen some people put fertilizer under the transplants when planting that are time-released. Is that a good idea? Um, it is. Hold on. Just lost the, the um, question thread here. Hold on. Is that a good idea? So it can be too much. And, you know, we're all sort of mad scientists and we want to overlove our plants. So even though my gardens now are well composted out, when I dig out a planting hole for a transplant, I put in, you know, a palm full of the organic granular if I have it. I'm also always buying mine on sale, so I'm not paying a lot for it. Here in Maryland, I get lucky sales in January and I can buy lots of fertilizer. So maybe like a tablespoon or two in the planting hole, put it in the bottom, but you really want to mix it through, like really mix that fertilizer in. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, it's it's okay. I will still do that. Um, I tend to want to set my plants up the best at planting, and then I sort of let them go and see what they need as they're growing. Um, Sean, and again, I keep repeating. I, I'm glad I saw your question, and thanks for watching. Make sure you guys put question in the front. This way I don't miss your question. What's the easiest way to compost? The biggest barrier is getting started. The easiest way is to get four posts, metal, wood, whatever you want. Make a four foot by four foot square. Get some chicken wire or whatever you want. Wrap it around all the way to the front so that you can just kind of hook it over and unhook it. And then just start filling that with leaves. You can just do leaf composting. You can do whatever composting you want. Um, you can put it in a sunny place, shady place. The whole key to compost is you want it to stay moist and it will break down. If you do cold composting, it could take two years, if maybe a little bit longer. If you're doing hot composting, check out my videos. You can see what you can do to kind of speed up the process. But that's a good question because I think we tend to overthink the design of some things. And compost, I wanted to make it even simpler just start putting it in a pile, four foot square, well, round pile, and then you wanna get it to three or four feet tall and you just keep adding material to it. Jay uh, Bay, what do you think for peppers, Gary? Should I keep it basic just like fish emulsion and nitrogen favored more at the start? Yeah, so I think what you're saying is, um, again, you know, depending on how well you're your earth beds are set up or if you're in let's do earth beds first so putting your plants in good amount of compost you could put in a handful of organic granular like sometimes I, I have a fireplace so I will take the the fire ash out which is a great form of phosphorus calcium and I will sprinkle it through my garden just fine amounts I have videos on it um, that adds some nutrients to it I'm just a little bit kind of maybe less dependent on having to go buy the organic granular but at setup you know, your soil set up nicely. You could put in a couple tablespoons of the organic granular, let that start breaking down like you said. That has to break down with microbiology to convert it into a form the plant can pull up through its roots. And you would hit it with a fish emulsion. That could be enough for your peppers until you start seeing them flower, seeing how they're doing. And if they're struggling a bit, yeah, you hit them again with some more fish emulsion. Um, in the video description, I am affiliated with AgroThrive and they have two types of organic fertilizers and one of them has a higher end, has a higher uh, phosphorus and potassium. It's perfect for the garden because it's delivering nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Sometimes at levels that are better than a fish emulsion, like the Alaska fish emulsion that I use is a five nitrogen, one phosphorus, one potassium. 
but you don't have to go crazy over figuring out you know the numbers like i said if your garden has the n p and k present even in low levels your plants are going to do fine Cocoa, is it okay to give the aspirin mixture to the tomato plant before you actually transplant in the garden? I don't think that it would hurt it, but it's not going to really do much. So for people that don't know, aspirin mimics a natural hormone in a tomato plant that triggers the SAR response. I think it's systemic something response. I'll, it'll come back to me. But it's a response that makes the plant think it's being attacked by disease, so it beefs up its defenses. Using the aspirin fools the plant, but it toughens up and it wards off diseases and sometimes insect attacks better. You don't really need to do it early. I plant mine. You could water it in at planting with the aspirin and you want to do the aspirin about every probably two weeks to four weeks, depending on how you're doing it. Um, I have videos on that also, but I don't really give my first dosing until the plant's been growing for a bit. And that's because the, the diseases and insects aren't rolling in for a while. So I wait for the plant to be bigger. I set up the solution. I soak the leaves, soak around the root stem. And, you know, I do that once or twice a month, depending on, you know, what part of the year it is. All right, Karen, what's your opinion of composted wood shavings and cow manure? How should it be applied? So I'm going to go with I'm fine with that. Wood shavings take a lot of nitrogen to decay and break down. So if you're putting fresh wood, wood shavings into your earth, not just as a mulch on top, but mixing it into the soil, it's going to pull nitrogen out of your soil. If your wood shavings are well composted, as you're sta stating, um, I would use it several ways. If you have a lot of it, end of the year, Throw it on top of your bed, a couple of inches, let it sit there. Come spring, just work it into the top four to six inches of your soil. If you're putting in transplants now, you could put in your transplants. If this stuff is good, you could mix a shovel full or so in a planting hole. Instead of dropping in your organic granular that you buy, you put in your compost. That's what I do sometimes too. Um, you could put in your transplants and then use it as a mulch and let it just slowly feed over time. So there's a whole lot you can do with it. The whole idea is that if you're going to plant seeds in it and you're going to put it down first, you want to make sure it's well composted down so it doesn't challenge the seeds for nitrogen. Glad to help. Uh, life in the Piedmont. All right, so here's a question too. Let me hold here with environmental. So again, you know, I'm, I felt like we got a late start. I th I'll probably keep going for another 10 minutes or so. So the public lives are every two Thursdays, the second and fourth Thursday of the month, gardening grounds, usually about 30 minutes. I present a topic for a couple of minutes and then we just get into the questions and take it from there. This is a public event, so there's a lot of people coming through here. So I'm trying to get as many questions as I can. If you like this style of learning, I have the PERC memberships, Tier 1, Tier 2, where a format is very similar to this. I do four or five Q&As, a couple live classrooms, some other events, and it's all geared to um, kind of teaching, but you know, maybe we have 20, 30, 40 people on at once, and I stay on for an hour. It's kind of a good group where people are getting to know each other, and we kind of chat, but the focus is on what do you need to do? What do you need from us to have help you have a better garden? Plus, the teaching classes are really formal and in depth, so it's like you know going to a class. All right, so environmental, and you can find that information out in the video description, or you just join. You find the join button on my YouTube page. I transplanted hydroponic tomatoes, and they wilted. What to do? The new soil was prepped well. I'm thinking. So I don't know a lot about hydroponic tomatoes into the ground. Um, they're living in a different environment. So I might, depending, I, you know, usually if a plant wilts at transplant or something like that, I just, you stop watering, you let the soil dry out. They have plenty of water if you know you've, you've, you've watered them. Um, 
take them out of the light. If they're outside and they're getting sun, put them in a shady place and you just kind of wait to see if they recover. But there's nothing else you want to do. When they're wilted, um, you don't want to hit them with more water or fertilizer. You just kind of want to hope for your best, um, for the best. Um, I mean, I wish I could help you more, but I don't know what to add to that. Yeah, so cow manure is the best. Um, Happy Gardener uh, felt like they used too much chicken manure. You can't, right. So maybe kind of to wrap up things. Compost, garden or forest floors, any compost you make, manures that you let break down, that is well below a 1, 1, 1 in P and K. Like when you hold it in your hand, it's like well below 1% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, 1% potassium very low steady amounts and that's how your plants have learned to grow and develop since time has been around when you buy fertilizer you might see like the miracle grow water solubles like 24 18 16 or something crazy high percentages a handful of plant tone from espoma might be a 533 np and k so it's possible that you over concentrate things too much you waste your money, maybe the plants grow too much, maybe the plants just look normal. But you have to keep in mind that the goal is low, slow, steady N, P, and K, primary macronutrients, you know, slow and steady sulfur, magnesium, calcium, secondary primary nutrients. And manures and compost do all of that. So, Angela, what can you do to get rid of red fire ants? Um, I, I don't know. I am using orange oil now, and it does kill off ants. It has a chemical that messes up and harms the shell, the exoskeleton of the ant. That can work. Um, I don't have a recipe yet. I'm still kind of working on it, but I'll talk about that later. If they eat bait, sometimes a baited trap, even though it's a poison, you know, you're putting it there, you're letting the ants get to it, they take it to the nest, they die off, it's not gonna harm your garden. You don't have to over worry about it. I might use that if it's wrecking your garden, sometimes you have to use more extreme measures. You wanna try organic solutions, you wanna try and manage things, but if you have a pest or a problem, that is decimating your garden and wrecking your ability to harvest anything, sometimes you have to go up the chain to something a little bit more harsh, and then you can go back to your organic ways. And that's, you know, sort of a personal choice. But I don't have anything specific for fire ants. Um, trying to find the nest, people pour boiling water into it, they'll put di diatomaceous earth, the, um, that gets into the joints of the ants, but if it, if a nest ha if you're not getting to the eggs and queens of a nest, you can kill off lots of the red ants, but the nest keeps producing. So that's the hard part. All right, I think we'll be wrapping up in a couple more questions. Let's see. PTL, if growing in containers, do you have to use manures? No, um, you can. You can use tea in a container, but basically for a container, you want something that's gonna hold water. So you, whenever you're buying mixes, it's usually like half peat moss and half earth, and it holds water. If you're making your own peat moss, er, earth, and then compost, maybe a third, a third, a third, there's a lot of ratios you can do. But you're making a nice, loose, water, contain, water absorbing, uh, yeah, container mix that's gonna hold water. That's the number one nemesis for containers, is watering. In that, you could add manures, you could add compost, and that sets up a beautiful soil. Once it's in the container, some handfuls of the organic granular, mix it through because your plants, mid-season, a larger tomato, larger cucumber, larger pepper, massive root system is going to be sucking out the water and nutrients. In that, I would be doing something like AgroThrive or fish emulsion every month, maybe more so when the plants are bigger. Teas are okay, um, but if in my opinion, if you're going to use something, I would rather go with the fish emulsion or the agro thrive. Teas are nice to add into it, but they don't do anything extra. Um, you know, it's really up to you. Hi, Jenny. Greetings from Oregon or to Oregon Coast. 
Is homemade liquid fertilizer contain N, P, and K? If yes, which one has more than the others? So it does. And I think you're talking about if you'd like rot down comfrey or even grass clippings and stuff. I don't know what ends up in there, but liquid fertilizer is really no different than composting. Anything you're taking and you're composting, you're throwing into a pile and it breaks down and the elements, nitrogen, phosphorus become available. People will do that in buckets of water. It smells, you know, I don't like doing it. I would rather just use the fish emulsion, but it is a way to save money. Um, they let it rot, the elements break down, they pour it on the plant, the N, P, and K is available. I can't tell you which one is the best, um, but a lot of people will do uh, stinging nettles, um, comfrey or something, and they just let it rot and they use that for their N, P, and K. DD, can I save seeds from cucumbers if I planted three different varieties next to each other? You can save them. There's always a chance that they're going to cross-pollinate. Um, and you know maybe get some cool variety they're still going to create cucumbers for you they just might have a quality um, you know from the mom and dad plant facing heavens are my favorite peppers for hot pepper flakes they grow really really well uh, Orville what do you recommend for leaf spot on tomatoes so I actually use hydrogen peroxide spray. So I don't want to go into the formula in detail here because I don't want you guys to damage your plants. But go to my channel, look up tomato spray, hydrogen peroxide in tomatoes. And I'm basically taking the 3% hydrogen peroxide, diluting it down, and then I spray my tomato leaves and other plants. And anytime you're using new spray, even if it comes from me, even if you trust me, which I appreciate, test spray. Spray some leaves, wait 48 hours, see if there's any damage. But I use hydrogen peroxide pretty much now for any kind of fungal disease on my tomato plants. All right, I think we have to wrap up there. I had a wonderful time. Um, let's just see. Uh, all right, we'll answer these two questions. Jenny, uh, pill bugs, I don't get them, so I don't do a whole lot with them. Um, in, Managing them, maybe somebody else has a solution, and we'll end with this. What's your beer of choice to drink? If you drink, you deserve one. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Um, I will have a beer, and I prefer actually more of the atmosphere. So my wife and I go out to a lot of the local breweries here, which are getting popular in Maryland. So I just kind of like to look for a Pilsner, something kind of mild. Used to like hops, don't like it so much more now. Um, but a pilsner or something like that something locally brewed and just kind of enjoy the day all right you guys take care two weeks from now another gardening grounds will be a public live they're usually 30 minutes if you like this format please check out my perk membership you guys have a great time in the garden